My name is Joseph Durani, and I'm one of the cardiovascular surgeons that takes care of children and adults with congenital heart disease at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And today we're going to have a little session on challenges that we face with the management of the adult congenital heart patient. And I'm fortunate to be surrounded by colleagues that represent different portions of the country. And I think what we can do now is we can have each introduce themselves and let and indicate where they're from, and then we can move forward with conversation. So I'm Stephanie Fuller. I'm from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and University of Pennsylvania. I'm Ralph Mosca from the NYU Langone Medical Center in New York City. I'm Tom McGilvery from the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. So it's no secret and at, at the STS uh, and its uh, sister meeting, the Southern Thoracic, there continues to be increased um, awareness and topics surrounding the management of the adult patient with congenital heart disease. And it's pretty well documented now that there are more adults with congenital heart disease than there are children. Uh, and this is in part due to the fact that uh, the great successes of infant heart surgery and surgery in children has, um, has um, resulted in children living well into the adult years that now may or may not be confronted with either residual lesions or recurrent lesions that are going to require attention. So today at the meeting, we had a symposium um, where we tried to see where there might be potential collaboration between um, pediatric cardiovascular surgeons and adult cardiovascular surgeons. And it's been well documented that, um, that many of these patients probably are served better with, um, with personnel that have a congenital background. But as we're learning, there can be um, other areas where maybe there could be um, even better results if we sort of align ourselves with our adult counterparts. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe what I'd like to ask each of you is, um, where do you think the, the, the potential points of collaboration or overlap would be in your practice? That is to say, I mean, have you, have you sort of buddied up with one of your adult counterparts to tackle, you know, certain congenital problems uh, in the Boston area? Uh, we have. The as you pointed out, there are, there are a number of issues that continue to evolve in caring for these patients. Uh, not only do they have evolving uh, issues with their congenital heart disease, they frequently are now reaching the age where they develop acquired heart disease. Uh, and acquired heart disease, uh, our colleagues who are adult experts uh, have a, a lot of experience and can help manage these patients in a, in a way that, like they manage uh, other adult uh, patients with these problems. Well, I would agree with that. And um, in particular, I would think, you know, one of the major areas would be arrhythmia management. So a lot of our patients with congenital heart disease, as they get older, and if, especially if they have residual valve lesions, uh, mitral or tricuspid valve lesions, they can develop very large hearts, large atria, and uh, atrial arrhythmias or abnormal heartbeats. And our adult counterparts, both on the medical and surgical side, have had a lot of experience with dealing with this, and in particular atrial fibrillation. And so I think we can learn a lot from their experiences with um, cryoablation, microfrequency ablation, um, ablation outside the heart without opening it, um, as well as, you know, cut and sew type of uh, uh, Cox maze procedure. So again, this is an area that is going to affect not only patients with primary acquired disease, but congenital disease as they get older. And I think we can you know, uh, use their information to help take good care of our patients. How about in Philadelphia, Stephanie? Yeah, I think one of the greatest opportunities for collaboration is really with the transplant patients. And um, in our case, we have uh, a comprehensive group of both adult and pediatric practitioners who evaluate um, congenital heart patients prior to transplant at, at an adult center. So these patients are evaluated for their anatomy, their physiology, any concerns, for example, on a failing Fontan. Um, the hepatologists are involved from both sides of the street. So it really has been a great example of how the two of us can work together and be very inclusive of each other's knowledge. So transplantation arrhythmias, maybe one of the things I'd ask each of you to comment on, because at our session this morning, there was a fair amount of discussion about uh, management of valve-related problems. And we had an adult, an, exper an experienced adult cardiac surgeon talk about how they approach a specific valve problem. And then we had a congenital surgeon talk about how they approached it. And we looked for sort of overlap takeaways that maybe each could add to their armamentarium. What, what, what do you all think about that? Uh, it's a, uh, I think it's a great opportunity for collaboration uh, because that uh, there's a lot about congenital uh, abnormalities of the valves that, that the acquired heart surgeons could learn a lot. Uh, and certainly uh, in those patients that have 
other associated congenital lesions that the acquired heart surgeons aren't used to managing. But I do think that congenital heart surgeons can, can learn a lot about the tremendous uh, advancements that have been made in the management of valvular heart disease and reparative techniques uh, that have really served the adult population very, very well for the last couple of decades. I would echo that. And um, in addition to, I don't want to change the subject too quickly, but in addition to valve disease, I mean, there's coronary disease, which we haven't talked about. And for it may be true or maybe not be true that patients with congenital heart disease perhaps have a slightly lower incidence of acquired coronary disease, but some of them do. And um, there are not all that many congenital surgeons now that are comfortable with coronary artery bypassing. And so I think, or and for that matter, angioplasty and stenting of the coronary arteries. And so that's another area where we need to draw heavily on our adult cardiologists and adult cardiac surgeons and invite them into the operating room. We may perform some intracardiac repair or revision of a conduit and then have them help us perform or do the coronary artery bypassing because, you know, they're the experts at that. So, so this leads into the next, uh, the next discussion time that I thought w is related to this that would be interesting to get your input on. So um, Stephanie works in a children's hospital and an adult hospital caring for these patients. And then the three of us are more or less a children's hospital within a hospital. So. Could you comment on maybe some of the advantages or disadvantages of that particular, f you know, formula with regard to the adult patient with congenital heart disease that needs surgery? Uh, it, of course, the, the best management of these patients is a highly competent team with a deep bench. Uh, and so that uh, the benefit of having uh, adult experts and uh, pediatric experts, not just in the surgical and medical, but nursing and social service side, are that we can bring all of what is uh, beneficial and necessary, can bring all those to bear on taking care of the patients. Wow, what is it like in, yeah, in Philadelphia? I would agree. We have a, a unique program in the sense that it's very individualized towards the patient. So um, selection of venue for surgery is often, first of all, based upon the patient's surgical anatomy, but then secondarily upon the comorbidities. So for a lot of patients who have acquired disease, not only cardiac disease, but for example, patients with prior stroke history who are followed by a hepatologist, hematologist, patients who are um, renal patients who are used to being cared for in the adult forum, I think for those patients, it's a real advantage to have them in a hospital where all those services are widely provided. And that's not the case in every pediatric hospital that is doing adult congenital heart surgery. Right. So that's one of the conundrums of taking care of these patients is each place may have to modify the way they do it to the best of their ability in their location. Uh, we're lucky in that we have a pediatric hospital within an adult hospital, which some people may find sort of anachronous. But, um, the fact that we're able to keep the patients within the same hospital and use our, pedi our pediatric and adult colleagues mm -hmm. uh, basically on the same floor um, is one of the benefits. Whereas in some of the pediatric freestanding children's hospitals, it's becoming more and more difficult to keep those patients under the same roof. So I guess it's probably fair to say that how it happens from hospital to hospital should be tailored to the local issues depending upon strengths and weaknesses. and. Maybe it's in a children's hospital in one environment. Maybe it's an adult hospital. Maybe it's a hospital within a hospital. How about now if we talk a little bit about that the middle-aged adult, particularly, specifically the women, that um, may have had a congenital lesion that was repaired. Maybe there's a residual defect, and they are approaching the family planning years, and they're trying to get counseling with regard to what is safe, what's permissible, what's not. How, how would you begin by... Um, providing advice uh, to somebody like that in terms of ensuring that they get the proper counseling. In Boston, Tom, what do you... I, I, I uh, it's a, a great question, and, uh, and I think that we've learned so much uh, in the last 20 years about that. And I think that, again, uh, having a, uh, a team of, of, of experts who can help you make those decisions, whether they be not just the cardiologist, but, but high-risk uh, obstetricians and perinatologists, and that partnership, uh, I think, uh, uh, can really help with sometimes these exceptional patients that don't necessarily fit into a very well uh, worked through paradigm. Uh, and so we, we have been uh, doing that on literally a case-by-case -case basis. And I, I think, 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of components to that that are even somewhat behind the scenes. For example, the presence of a geneticist in an adult hospital who's able to counsel women and families prior to pregnancy. I think the issues not only with obstetrics, but also with gynecology, particularly in terms of contraception for a lot of our patients. Um, and lastly, I think the presence of not only a, um, a cardiac surgeon who's potentially involved at the time of delivery, but also a cardiac anesthesiologist and an ICU that's equipped to handle a patient who's postpartum. Those are all important issues, and we've encountered those issues repeatedly, and I think it's really helped to kind of establish a very thorough approach to patient care. I would, I would agree with all that. I think that this, you picked the one scenario where it really highlights the absolute need to be a team. Um, there are so many issues that go into aging and congenital heart disease and women's health all added up uh, together. That's very complex. There's very little absolute data on what's best for these patients. So we have to pick places and pick people who have the greatest amount of experience and draw upon that uh, to take the best care of them. So even in, even in addition to the, the planning that may go on in advance, we still encounter the, the young woman who finds out that they are pregnant, w not being aware of their, you know, their cardiac problem, that then may need cardiac surgery during pregnancy. And, and this is something that we actually have a growing experience with to the point that we now have, we actually have written protocols for the management of the pregnant patient during the course of pregnancy and protocols for the operating room in terms of how surgery is going to be conducted and you know, the bypass, you know, arrangement is slightly different and there's modifications that need to be done. So it really does, I think, highlight the, important, the importance of people that really are knowledgeable and have made a commitment to really understand this. It's now, I, th I think, in cardiology, I think you indicated earlier that there, there is a formal, you know, there's formal training with credentialing now in the cardiology side um, for adults with congenital heart disease. And we know from a surgical side, we have credentialing for congenital per se, which, which um, encompasses both you know, the child and the adult, but clearly it's a growing, it's a growing population. How about the transition from, from, from pediatrics to adulthood? Does, did you have any, any specific thoughts on what you think would be important advice to, to patients you know, when you're seeing them early on in terms of what to expect in the long term? What is, well, I think, I think uh, probably all of us would agree that one of the most important components to this is just starting the patient very early in terms of assuming knowledge for their own medical condition, their medications, their surgical history, and really getting them comfortable with the concept of transition as early as, you know, 12, 13 years of age. Um, and that, that's been something that we have been working on. It, it takes, I think, a, a very comprehensive group to do that again. And um, not only looking at the cardiologist, but potentially also having psychologists involved, also having child life specialists involved with these children who really have to assume quite a bit of responsibility at a young age. Yeah, I would agree. I think the earlier, I mean, to a certain degree, the earlier, the better. Certainly teenage years are, is the time to start. And I think one of the other components is to not only for them to gain some knowledge of their own condition, but to familiarize them with the people who are gonna, they're going to be transitioning to. So they're not just dropped off at age 18 or 21 with someone they've not known for their whole uh, lives. And so I think the best way to do it is to, again, have a team, which we all have, and um, have the pediatric cardiologist who's been taking care of them and their surgeon, if they're going to be the same surgeon, you know, talk to the person who's going to then take them on and as, make it an actual transition rather than just a handoff. Yeah, I agree. Uh, for, for many of these complex patients, their pediatrician and their pediatric cardiologists and their pediatric cardiac surgeons and the pediatric hospital that they've been to has been their sanctuary. It's been their safe place. Uh, and regardless of their age, uh, it can be a very difficult transition depending upon how it's done. And so I think that all of us uh, in our teams uh, expressing to the patient and their family that this, uh, this is a continuum of care uh, that, uh, and, and, and make that transition a, gradu a, a gradual one uh, so that as the needs come up, uh, the members of the team are already well known, already well established, uh, and makes it comfortable for the patient to make that transition. I think gradual and deliberate. <laughs> because I think that part of, I mean, in my experience, I mean, uh, some of these uh, middle-aged adults were never really counseled that they actually needed to continue with some kind of surveillance to some degree, whether it's annual or every few years or, 
or whatever. And I think as good as we've gotten in cardiac surgery, there are probably are very, very few things that we do that would be a single fix that would not require oversight in the long term. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is it's the other way around. I mean, almost everything that we yeah. do requires some kind of long term, you know, surveillance for, you know, upcoming, you know, changes and what, whether it's medical therapy, whether it's a percutaneous intervention, whether it's surgery, whatever. Um, how about giving patients advice? If a patient approaches you and, and, and says, you know, what, what would be the most important advice you could give me? And let's say they're in the teenage years before they go off to college. I mean, what would be, what would be advice that you would, you would give them, um, at least from a surgical standpoint, uh, you know, alongside your, you know, your cardiology colleague? I think that uh, in keeping with the theme, uh, telling them it's a team sport, you, you want to go to an institution that has a good team, uh, an institutional team that's a, that they're functioning at the professional level, uh, and that uh, uh, doesn't matter if you have a good quarterback or a good running back. What really is important is the entire team. I would echo that and also tell them wherever they wind up to maintain contact with the person that they trust. Um, and we can help them with that when they move from place to place because we know the teams that work very well. But to not to be lost to follow up because, as you say, they're going to have residual lesions and ongoing issues that they're going to need to deal with. Yeah, and if I could only add to that, I think, I think the most important thing is making sure that patients realize that this is a lifelong need for them, and not only is the medical care going to be lifelong, but there are no guarantees that the next surgery will be their last. And that's uh, a problem I frequently encounter is patients coming in surprised that they need a second or a third time operation, and in the meantime, it might not be the last. Very good. So maybe to summarize some of the, the points here, so I think there are probably many points of overlap between the our adult counterparts and the pediatric counterparts, and we should we should look where where those overlaps may be and take advantage of what we might be able to learn from our adult, adult colleagues, and hopefully maybe they can take a few things away from us. I think the location of whether it's a children's hospital or an adult hospital probably is dictated mostly by local issues. It may be more appropriate to do something in a children's hospital in one city, but maybe not in another city. Um, lifelong surveillance and oversight seems to be a pretty common theme here, mm -hmm. and um, an orderly transition and transfer of care from the pediatric years into the adult years, which then should go on for an extended period of time, and that there's great promise and hope for the young woman who wants to get pregnant. Um, uh, many of the lesions, I think, uh, pregnancy can be um, accomplished safely, and, and if not with the lesion there, the lesion can be fixed in preparation for family planning, uh, and that more and more protocols are falling into place for the young woman who wants to um, um, pursue a family in a very, I think, optimistic, positive way. Well, thank you for your thank input you. and insight, and thank you.